everything as far as licks and everything else always start off slow i mean even if you're playing the bass line start off slow because you can always increase it Hi, and welcome to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. If you've ever wanted to learn bass, you should know that right now there are thousands of people inside the For Bass Players Only community. A lot of them over 50. They are learning bass, having the time of their life playing music that they love. You should come join them so you can experience that incredible transformation for yourself. As I always say, you're never too old to groove, so let's play bass. My guest this week is someone who's playing I have admired for a long time. I'm so happy to meet him in person, well, in Zoom person, uh, David Dyson. Originally, he, he was born in Rapid City, South Dakota, then moved to Washington, D.C. with his family at age two. David played the euphonium in school and county orchestras, and everything was going fine until he discovered Larry Graham and Lewis Johnson, and nothing has ever been the same for him ever since. And his parents sound like they were very encouraging. They, they gave him his first bass when he was 12, and that turned out to be a life-changing event. Eventually, David started doing all kinds of performances in school, church, top 40 bands, funk, R&B, did some session work. And again, with his parents' blessing, he enrolled at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And since graduating, he has been a busy bass player. He's performed and recorded with everyone from New Kids on the Block and Pieces of a Dream to George Duke. Regina Bell, Michael Franks, Jonathan Butler, Candy Dulfer, Gerald Albright, and bassist Michelle Endege Ocello. She is awesome. Maybe you can uh, hook me up with her. I'd love to get her uh, interviewed on this site. David's also released a few albums of his own as a leader, Soulmates, The Dawning, and Unleashed. So this is his first time on For Bass Players Only. Welcome, David. It's great to have you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> well, you're welcome. You have a very impressive uh, CV, and I'm sure there must have been a lot of stuff that I left out. And I wonder if we could just start with the early days and maybe you can fill in some of the gaps for us. Tell me about your, how would you describe your initial exposure to music and how you became a bass player over and above what I already mentioned? Right. Well, Basically, I mean, just I always loved music. My parents loved music. And so uh, between my parents and my 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 godmother, uh, you know, visiting her, she was in the music. So it was in, and they all had different stuff like I would at home was listening to Slide and Family Stone and, uh, you know, early uh, Grand Central Station. And my, my mother loved the Fifth Dimension and, <laughs> you know, um, all that stuff. And she listened to Dionne Warwick. And then I. I go over to my godmother's house and she'd have rare earth and, mm -hmm. and, uh, Isley brothers. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Dr. John and, uh, you know, it goes on and on. She'd have a lot of, you know, the slide of family stone, Pete funk, everything. And my father, he had all the funkadelic and even Richard Pryor records, new birth, uh, war, um, John Coltrane, Miles, I mean, it goes on and on. So I would go, I would have my tapes ready. Every time I go to visit my godmother, I have a bunch of blank tapes. So I could tape all the stuff I didn't have, you know. So that's how I was. And that was interesting. So that was my fun going to visit family members, taping their music, you know. <laughs> were they Stealing all their music? Were they more than just fans? Do, do you come from a musical family? Anybody play an instrument or sing or anything? Not like that? really. Well, my mother did play piano. She plays piano, and and um, they all loved music, but and like dancing and music, but not really uh, necessarily musically inclined. You know, they just were music lovers. All music lovers. Same thing with my father. Just music lovers. No talent in the music, though. You know. Uh, but my mother, I didn't know she played played piano until, until she got old and then wanted to buy a piano. And then she just started back up reading like she she had never stopped. I was like, that's pretty incredible. You stop playing all those years, you buy a piano, and now you're playing and reading like like if you were back in the day. That just amazed me. That's so, great. Well, uh, it sounds like your parents have always encouraged you. Now you can repay that and uh, encourage exactly. you. 
it uh, exactly exactly yeah. you're bringing back a, a lot of happy memories you mentioned the fifth dimension i worked with them in miami oh, wow. we did a, wow. a broadway show called ain't misbehaving it was all the old fats waller tunes and tin pan mm -hmm. Alley. show was a right. black They're nice people too and when you said rare earth I, I have always wanted to play the drums, and there's one thing that I really want to play on the drums more than anything else. You mentioned Rare Earth. Uh, I just want to celebrate. Yes. And there's a time you when know, <laughs> you know that song, it stops, and the drums. Absolutely. I want to play that on the drums. <laughs> Someday I will. And boy, Miles and Coltrane and Sly and Larry and, and Dion Warwick, that's that's quite a cross-section. So how, how, what, yeah. what about the bass, other than the obvious, like I mentioned, you heard uh, right. Larry and uh, Lewis, but uh, d d were you, <laughs> from the time you heard them till the time you got your bass at age 12, were you like immersed in bass or interested in bass or listening to the bass? I mean, how did it come to you actually getting one from your parents? Well, I was listening all the time. And it's funny because before they were headphones, they were like just like a ear one like a one earphone thing, just like one sided thing. Yep. And that wasn't good enough for me. So I always I would position the speakers of my um my parents and, and my um um stereo system. I would put a pillow on the floor and put I had my own, you know, my own headphones. It probably wasn't good for my ears, but I wouldn't have it blasting. But I would have one speaker over here, one sp and one speaker both facing in, and a pillow in between. And I would lay down, and that's how I would listen to my music. It's funny, <laughs> so I, so I mean, I had the early headphones, you know, um, and I would just listen. And my parents had the eight track tapes, you know. I would listen to those. You know, I had all, this, you know, that had all the music on there, and so I would just. That was my fun time. You know, I mean, I was in the sports, but when I wasn't out running around and playing sports or basketball or baseball or whatever, I'm back in or, or doing martial arts. That music was just, you know, always there, you know. And um, is there so, some special I, music you like to listen to when you're doing martial arts? Uh, you, it's funny. Uh, not really. Yeah. Yeah. Usually upbeat. You know, so anything upbeat, but not any, not necessarily any particular artist. It's funny because the, I can say when I, when I'm on the grill, I want certain music. Generally, I usually like, you know, my reggae. I put reggae music on when I'm doing the grill. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. Um, but it, I, I have such a wide variety of music that I listen to. It's just hard to say when I'm driving. I do have a preference. It's usually, uh, uh, well, sometimes it's even, it's old school rap. And then, but sometimes if it's late at night, it's uh, uh, kind of mystical jazz, you know? <laughs> you know, I'm like uh, Lonnie Liston Smith. Uh, um, um, what's my favorite album? I can't even think. Uh, Exotic Mysteries, stuff like that. There I love go. driving to that kind of stuff, you know? Um, you know, I don't want anything to put me to sleep, you know, but I want it's just, you know, so it's funny that you equate music to certain things I do when I do martial arts. Because a lot of times when I'm a lot of times I won't put the music on to inspire me, you know, if I'm working on the bag or whatever, because I'm just, you know, I'm just concentrating on, you know, flow or whatever. I'm not really concentrating on the music. But when I was training in uh the martial arts gym with, you know, Master Lloyd Irvin and stuff, they always had music on no matter what we were doing. But I never really paid attention to it. I was just pe paying attention to technique and, well, you know, flow and stuff. So I guess it's funny. I, I guess you're just making me realize now when it comes to martial arts, the music doesn't really play a big part of it, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, but what, uh, what about Berkeley? It, it's a great school. My son graduated from Berkeley. About yeah, great gosh, almost two years ago already. Uh, I, I assume you were a bass major, right? Or bass? Yeah, major. yeah, I was bass major. That was my principal instrument, of course. Who were your bass teachers? I gotta know. Rich, uh, well, Rich Appleman was the chairman, and he probably still is. Uh, no, no, he he stepped down about five, six years ago. Steve Bailey took over for him. Oh wow! Yeah, he was. Of course, he wasn't there at the time. I yeah, Rich, Rich had that gig for Rich had that gig for about forty years. 
Yeah, that was long. Well, that's gonna say that's gonna show how long it's been since I've been there. Um, his son is there graduated. now. His son is in the base department. What, what's his name? Uh, Tom, I think. Okay. Oh, yeah. I don't think, yeah. Yeah. He, well, of course, he wasn't there when I was there. But let me see. My first year, I think it was Ed Freeland. Oh, Ed I Freeland. Love Ed. Yeah. I don't. I, I didn't even know he was on the faculty there. I, I know yeah, Ed well. I guess uh, there's a lot I don't know about him. I just love Ed. Yeah, yeah, Ed's cool people. He he was there, and then um, then I think my second year was uh, uh, John Nabs. He ended up passing away, but he was an upright bass player. Yeah, uh, it, but it's funny. All his lessons, the lessons were all on piano. He never picked up. The, I never saw John Nabs play the upright with me. You know, he was always on the piano for the lessons. Then he passed away sadly while I was there. Um, um, at some point, and then um, John Rapucci was okay. my last. I, I'm sure Bruce Gertz was there, and I'm trying to yeah. think. Yeah, oh, yeah, Bruce Gertz. That I wanted him as a teacher. I didn't. I didn't really know that he was like the cat until it was too late. It was time for me to graduate. And I was like, because I wasn't really doing my homework on that, I, and I really didn't. You know, um, I was trying to get out. I was learning a lot from the other students there. You know, checking oh, out sure. the bad cats over there. Absolutely, that's where I was getting a lot of it. But John Rapucci definitely helped me with. Um, um, like being able to sing one line and play another line. That's really hard. That's still something that's that's, that's hard for me. It's people like Sting and yeah. Hendrix and Bootsy. Cats like that, it's like second nature. They can talk and play the same line or play different things, and they can separate them and, and be proficient at both. I need to, uh, you know, I need to I work on it. You know, it's like, when I'm asked to do background vocals for certain folks, I'm like, okay, I gotta, you know, I gotta practice that. So, um, and uh, I think the ultimate was when I was with Steve Coleman in the Five Elements. So, um, he had us playing. It was like a page of, it was like a line. I mean, uh, the whole. It was like a whole page of a line, like you know, the whole line, and we had to memorize that. We had to sing that over a bass line. And I was afraid to do it for a while. And so when he had the mic up there, I was faking, right? For a minute, I was faking it first. He said, you're going to sing tonight. And I was like, oh, shoot. So, and uh, I think we were in France. And when I did it, I was so proud of myself because I was like, oh, I can do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if I could do that, I was like, I could sing anybody else's lines and play a bass line, you know? So that kind of, uh, but I, I uh, credit John Rapucci for that. Um, that that's one lesson that he was giving that was probably the most valuable that 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 he had for me. Um, and he you, had like books, huh? How, I was going to ask, how did your career get rolling? I'm I'm guessing that that Berkeley, having gone to Berkeley, had something to do with that. You meet a lot of people, and you're in that environment. But how did it happen for you? Okay, well. The first, um, of course, you know, making a name amongst the other players, you know, and doing recitals. I started doing everybody, you know, different people's recitals and I was playing for everybody. And um, but I wasn't making any money outside of Berkeley. I wasn't doing any gigs yet. And my cards, my um, business card said specialty funk and, you know, OK, well, then that means if anybody that needs the jazz jazz player is not going to call me because they see my card. Or is it special specialty funk or they need a Latin uh, group or, or for, for reggae, for anything else, fusion or whatever. They're going to be like, this guy only knows how to play funk. No, no, you know what I mean? And it wasn't until <laughs> it wasn't until my roommates, I was in an apartment and they were all, you know, killer musicians and stuff. And, and they had a round table and I was at the center of it. And it was like, uh, you need to be on time with your payments. You need, we need, you know, you you got to pay your rent, you know, kind of thing. And I was kind of mad. I was like, how dare them? But I was like, no, I, I I can't be mad at them. You know, they're right, you know? So I had to kind of humble myself. And um, I said, and I started f trying to figure out, okay, what am I doing wrong here? So I, first thing I went is to cap copycat or whatever the place is that does the cards. I had my cards redone. Um, let you know, no, I'm that that you know, all genres, you know, all genres of a bass player and 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 things like that. You know, I just you know, I started asking how how's the best way to do my business card. And it's like, so that's what started. And then I picked up a job at Dunkin' Donuts. I started working at Dunkin' Donuts. So, um, 
You weren't playing bass that, at Dunkin' Donuts, were you? No, no, no. I was, I was slinging dough. No, I'm just kidding. Just I was, <laughs> I was at the cash register and handing people donuts and making coffees and stuff. And um, of course, I was getting mad at friends. You know, at the time, the commercial was time to make the donuts. Time you know, to make the, the donuts. <laughs> yeah, all the friends were teasing me. But it's funny though. It was when I humbled myself and got a job and got a part time job. And changed my business cards and, 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 you know, changed the whole thing. That's when I started getting gigs outside of Berkeley. I started really pick. They started really picking up. And it got to the point where I just told, you know, I had to stop at Dunkin' Donuts, you know. And um, it's funny. So um, my best friend, he was playing. I mean, he was working at Dunkin' Donuts before me. And he got the job with Piece of a Dream way back then. And so then when I started working at junk and donuts and then i got the call for new kids on the block after I, and so so um all my friends were like tag maybe we should start working at dunk and donuts you know everybody wanted to work at dunk and donuts then. <laughs> was, <laughs> but, but, uh, was there a particular but, gig that that uh that made you feel like you know I, i've made it or this is gonna catapult me into something else because you said it started to pick up was there a significant gig that really uh push things ahead uh, well i can't say any particular gig i think they all were kind of grooming me for for that moment because there was one point where one of the staff members at berkeley i didn't even know that recommended me for a, a an audition for a group called the, the young rascals or something i think it was the rascals I, yeah. and i had a thought i thought of i've heard of them but i i never listened to any music the music i never, didn't know so i went into the audition and i was like i wasn't prepared so but i obviously wasn't the right guy for the gig cuz i had you know i didn't know the music and stuff but i was like okay i need to uh and so really that's kind of you know i appreciate the person that recommended me but it's that's that's an important thing too. recommending the right one person for the gig, which I also found out doing my my uh, scene, my recital. I had a zillion people on it. I had Mark Whitfield. I had Cyrus Chestnut. I had all these big hitters, wow. all these killer players on it, but they had to play the right part. And I had the, the first half of my recital was straight ahead and then the second you know was straight ahead and fusion got kind of and the second um second part of my show was all funk yes um I had a feeling that's a where you were going. what'd you say i had a feeling that's how you were going <laughs> to <finish that thing. laughs> well, well it's funny and i had even uh you know i hit up uh, uh delphio marcellus to be part of the horn section for the funk thing and um uh but he uh then when he, I said, well, how do you like, you know, I handed him a tape and I'm like, how do you, how do you like what, uh, how do you like the music? He's like, uh, he, you know, he said some things like, yeah, it's not really my thing. And I'm like, okay, fine. That's no problem. I'll get somebody else. Then he got mad at me because I got somebody else in this place. But I learned in that whole thing to, uh, you know, cause I had like three or four different drummers and that wasn't smart, you know? Yeah. And, um, uh, I learned just pick a guy that's more versatile, pick, pick one or two guys somebody that can do the job, but less headache for yourself, you know? And, um, um, so I learned a lot, just putting together the whole show and for my recital and, and then playing with all these bad cats, you know, then they started calling me for their recitals and they calling me for gigs. But I think the, the big gig was, um, one of my, um, uh, I started, Oh, another thing I started doing, there was a staff member that started calling me for all the big shows at Berkeley all the big shows, um, like the graduation shows and things and that would honor certain killer players like Dave Grusin and, uh, you know, and producers and writers, Dave Grusin. I did the one for that. I did Herbie Hancock. I did, I did a bunch of them, but those two, um, really put me on the map. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, then he had a show. Uh, I remember the day I got the new kids audition, I really did. I didn't want to go. It was a cold, slushy day in Boston. And I, I can't remember. I had just finished coming from somewhere. And I was like, I want to just be at in my apartment. And that was it. And I got the call. Come on down to Roxbury, the Maurice Star studio, um, you know, the audition for this group. I had never heard of New Kids on the Block. I didn't know, you know, I'd heard of Maurice Star, but 
I was like, all right, all right. And and I, I guess my attitude at the time, the, the guy that called, I was like, man, I just came from such and such. He's like, man, I'll pay for the cab myself. Just come on down and stop, you know, you know, whining about it. I'm like, all right, all right you're right. But so I came on down to the studio and um, it was Marie Starr and had a bunch of other people just hanging around. Um, and um, by the way, in me, I, I, I get annoyed when a whole bunch of people are just hanging around that aren't part of the studio session for, for myself. So I'm always like, all right, everybody out that's not in part of this thing, you know. But it was people hanging around, and um, I pulled out my bass, and Maurice was like, okay, well, um, oh, I'll just play, uh, you know, play, play, play Please Don't Go Girl. Well, obviously, that was a um, New Kids song that I had never heard of. It was on one of the records. And um, so I looked at one of the guys, <laughs> Maurice is over here, and I looked at the guy over here that was sitting in the studio. I'm like, what the heck is Please Don't Go Girl? <laughs> and he said, he said, that's the new hit of uh, New Kids on the Block. Um, and I was like, oh, shoot. So I'm thinking I lo I'm, that's it for me. I lost the gig right there. And um, Maurice, he was like, it's all good. It's a go. Just run off some Delphonics, OJs, something, you know, run off some old R&B or something, you know. And so I, I did. I started playing for him. And he was like, cool, cool, cool. So I put my bass, and I didn't play much. Put my bass away, and he him, he himself took me back to my apartment and uh, was talking to me, and he was, he put in a cassette tape. That tells you how long ago it was. Put a cassette tape in and said, I put 200 thousand um, dollars of my own money into promoting this group and they're going to be the greatest thing since the Beatles and that was New Kids on the Block and he said well I'll you know I'll call you uh, I'll, I'll call you if uh, if you're the one you know I said alright well cool well thanks for the opportunity I got out and um, eventually I got the call he called me and um, then, of course that changed my life you know uh, the whole I didn't know what I was up for um, I got the gig um uh, and uh, the guy that had called me was the musical director for a while uh, until eventually he lost the gig and they looked to me and said, all right, well, you're the musical director now, you know, kind of <laughs> kind of gave me the because I was giving the band a lot of cues anyway, because that director, he was um, legally, legally blind. So a lot of times he was just kind of banging on the keyboards and I was giving the cues. So that was kind of like my my uh, my learning grounds for being a musical director. How long Someone were you with New Kids on the Block? About two and a half years. Who was the drummer? I'm curious, because I met someone who said he was the drummer. Yeah, his name was Derek Antunes. And, oh, and he, his name was Derek Antunes, and he's actually, he was actually from, uh, dang, I can't remember what part of Massachusetts he's from, but um, he's young. He was the youngest one in the group. He was Really young boy. He could play drums. He ended up moving out to uh, and marrying somebody from Australia. Wow. He, Did you, you know, know of a drummer up. named Robin who played with them? No, yeah. that was after. That was after the whole. Okay. We did the, all, all our world tours and stuff. And it, it was it was before they took uh, that. Anybody else like that must have been after they took a long hiatus they took like oh home. i think this was before because i met somebody at the, at a nam show at, in like 1991 and oh, wow. he said he played with new kids on the block he said his name was robin and he said his last name was dimaggio and i said oh jokingly is joe your father and he said no he's my grandfather wow so i just oh, thought he might have been on your radar drums yeah I'm pretty uh, sure I remember. Sure I mean, 1991 was a long you time. He wasn't pulling your chain because Derek Antunes was the drummer from 1989 to oh, 91 uh, yeah. into 92. Know. It was uh, yeah. So John, Derek ago. was the drummer. Derek was the only drummer that whole time. Only per people we switched was guitar players. We switched. There was a, gu a female guitar play player initially. Um, cause when I came on, they were doing tracks. They had no band. So I ah. was the, with the original band. I was the bass player. Derek Dantunes was the original drummer. Um, Yasko Kubota, who also was from Berkeley, killer, uh, jazz pianist. She, um, rest in peace. She passed away. She, um, played keyboards with, uh, new kids. Um, 
And who else did we have? It, that was that was pretty. Let me see. Bass well, you, drums. You played with drums. a lot of people over a, quite a long period of time. What's keeping you busy today, David? Um, piece between pieces of a dream. Um, and Walter Beasley and Eric Darius. Um, those are the those are the uh, the more uh, frequent gigs, you know. Uh, between them, they're keeping me the busiest. Um, Eric Darius, Walter Beasley. Pieces mm -hmm. of a dream, yeah. And but I do stuff with Peter Peter White. I have stuff with him coming up. Um, Brian Simpson. Um, I just did a cruise, and they just sent me the thing for the next cruise, which was really fun because I got to play with, you know, one of my great mentors, Marcus Miller. He asked me to come on the All Star Show and play with him. Um, so on on the boat, I played with Eric Marenthal, who was a oh. killer sax player, yeah, and yeah. I loved his music. I loved his music. I have to say, I, I had his set was the funnest for me because um, kind of reminded me, me of my Berkeley days too. You know, I mean, I got to play a lot of fusion and it was just all good music. Um, and I played with Candy Dolfer. She's a killer, yeah, killer sax player, just so talent, talented. You know, I played a lot with her. Um, uh, then a lot of uh, up and coming young. Um, it was a whole bunch of sax players: Marcus Anderson, Markwell Jordan. Uh, Vincent, Vincent and Gala, uh, Larry Braggs, he used to sing um, with Tower of Power. So his gig was really fun, too. Well, that's great. Um, that's, so, you're still so involved and you're keeping busy and you're doing all kinds of different stuff. I want to ask you a question, if you can put on a, an educator's hat for a minute. For bass players okay. only, as I mentioned, is a bass instruction site. And... I've got people from from pretty much every state in the U.S. and, I don't know, 50, 60 countries worldwide, last time anybody counted. And most of them are adults, as I also hinted, and uh, most of, mostly men in their 50s, 60s, 70s. I've got some students in their 80s, both men and women. And these people are not trying to be... Uh, try, trying to have a, a career in music. They just want to play some classic rock riffs with their buddies or some blues shuffles or maybe a little funk R&B, maybe a little walking bass. And right. another thing that happens, and I'm, I'm saying this just to give you a context here, when you get it, it, you know, it, it to that age range, sometimes things like arthritis and tendonitis and other things creep in. So again, I, I just, just to, just to give you the whole picture here, because I want to ask you with those things in mind, what kind of advice could you impart to somebody like that who wants to learn to play bass? What should they be thinking about? What should they be focused on? What questions should they be asking? What should they, you know, what should their goals be and anywhere, jump in anywhere. Hmm, that's interesting. I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, well, there are not first, too many people that do what I do. This is my 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 niche here, or as my right. Canadian wife would say, niche. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I mean, well, first of all, it depends on what kind of music that they love. I mean, like, if you're getting up in age, I wouldn't say not to try to tackle, like, you know, fusion type stuff or, 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 or you know, but... um. Mostly classic um, rock from the 70s and maybe the 60s. Right. And oh, some that's all the lot good of blues. Stuff. All the, it's all the good stuff. I mean, I, I that's, a, that's a hard question because I would just still, I mean, first of all, the way I look at it, listening and having a wide uh, vocabulary uh, as far as, um, and, and when I say vocabulary, I mean not in, um, to pull from not in tools as in licks yet because you're just starting off. But I mean, as far as um, a library of music to listen to, I, I always looked at that as being at least 80, 80 to 90 percent of practicing. Um, not having a, a, a huge library of music, but if you're just doing it for fun in your genre, just start start off with stuff that you love. Some of your favorite songs that you used to you know, and just start off slow. Everything, as far as licks and everything else, always start off slow. I mean, even if you're playing the bass line, start off slow because you can always increase it. It's, that's always, the, but just don't start off, you know, thinking you're going to start running off a whole bunch of riffs. I mean, so that's what I've told all, all my students before. Always start off slow. You know, if you can't uh, play it at the tempo that 
it, uh, that that the song is at and just start off slow, but just be, you know, start off slow and clean. And, and it, it's um it's a hard question to answer because answer because it's a lot of things, a lot of things uh, involved here. Um, uh, influences to listen to, you know, I mean, those are things, those are things that really inspire you and keep that fire burning, you know, like, as they like, uh, Lewis Johnson and Larry Graham, they're the ones that, okay, they're the ones that inspired all that passion and stuff and made me, you know, and that's what gives you, and then the love of the music, that's what gives you the stick to itiveness to learn you know, to, to stick to learning. Cause the people, you, you know, don't get frustrated. I mean, everybody's going to get frustrated at first, but you just stick to it and you don't have to learn a lot of songs, stick to one song at a time and learn one part at a time, stick to one, learn one part, learn it slow. Once you get that and you can get that up to speed, then learn the next talk, let, let, learn the next, next part, learn the B section, learn the bridge. Once you get a full song and you can play a full song, then move on to the next. But take it slow, you know, with, with everything. And um, and those are good practices for learning songs. Like I said, on this cruise, I had to learn between 90 and 100 songs. You know, I played with uh, I played with like. I thought the, my I thought last year in Punta Cana playing with 11 artists, I thought that was going to be the hardest for me. We you know I would we would do sound uh, rehearsals sound checks gigs and then by the time i got back to my villa it was 1 a.m and i'm up learning and uh, going over songs for the next day with the next artist and i would go to bed at 4 a.m get right back up at seven and start the whole day again so you know talking about lack of sleep and everything else so um but learning the songs that's one of the reasons i got the gig not only that i played with a lot of the artists that are on there and they vouched for me but be, um, you have to be somebody that can learn a lot of music and be able to be able to play with a lot of art, you know, a lot of artists on it. Not a lot of there are a lot of great musicians, but uh, can they play with a lot of artists and, and pull it off? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's so, usually not a problem for the people that, that I'm working with because they might have their buddies or they may have their, you know, like I said, classic rock from the 70s. But I, I really right. like what you said about vocabulary and then you said influences. And I think those can really work well together if you listen to people from, you know, whether it's Carol Kay or James Jamerson or Joe Osborne or, or uh, right. you know, people that that played the music paul mccartney you know absolutely and, and you could listen to how they do it but also you know if if there's some tasteful fills or things that you could add to your arsenal that you keep in your back pocket that you can pull out if and when it helps the song i i really like what you said i think those two things in my mind really tied together well i don't know if that if uh, you intended it to <laughs> to, to be that way yeah. but. well i'm glad i did and I, let me add to that that you're absolutely right because i've realized many times throughout the years that, that the more i've increased my vocabulary you may not think it'll come in handy but I'll come up with a lick somewhere. And I was like, that sounds familiar. Where did I get that from? And it'll be in a whole, it could even be in a whole different genre, but I'll, I'll come up with a lick online. I'm like, where did I get that from? And it's because it's, you know, it's in there and you just pulled it out and you're not even aware of who you got it from sometimes. You know what I mean? You know, you know um, I remember playing the guitar and I couldn't have been any older than 12, 13, 14. And I liked, I liked mostly classic rock and I was listening to some blues or blues oriented rock. And I remember the moment that I discovered that at the end of a phrase, the note they would play would be the, the five. They go do, 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 do. And, and I remember adding that, to my vocabulary it's only I, I just sang it horribly but but you know what i mean I, I, the moment I added that to my vocabulary it was only one note but how often do you you hear it in jazz you hear it in rock you hear it in blues at the end of a phrase to play the five of the, the chord or the five you know the the root of the five chord even if you're not playing root you know 
a right. oriented instrument like the bass. So uh, you're, you're bringing back some very helpful, valuable things that I had almost forgotten about. And I really appreciate you saying all that stuff. Very helpful. Oh, 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 thank you. Um, you know, there is something that I know about you that I don't think you know. And something uh -oh. that a great part of my audience knows about you that I doubt you know. Uh -oh. my, my latest book came out, I think, about two years ago, my 10th book with Hal Leonard Corporation. And it's right. called, right. it's called, thank you, it's called Funk Jazz Bass. And this was different from all the other books that I wrote because my funk book is on slapping and I have a finger style funk. I have a rock book, a blues book. I have a book called Bass Aerobics, a book called Play Like Jocko Pastorius. That one nearly killed me. But <laughs> I wrote a book that, that's called Funk Jazz Bass, and it is a play in the style of book which is very different for me. It really took some discipline because I took a list of 30 bass players, everybody from Jeff Berlin to Stanley Clark to uh, Gary Willis to Abla Boreal to uh, James Jamerson and uh, Bagiti Kumalo. So there's some finger style, there's some fretless, there's some slapping. And one of those 30 people goes by the name of David Dyson. Oh, I'm on it. I'm on it. <laughs> it is. I'm on it. It, it's not some licks that I stole from you and, and copied. It's from listening to your style and coming up with, yeah, I, I was kind of afraid that, you know, if Stan the Clark saw this or this or Nathan East uh, is in there. He wrote the foreword to the book, but I, I was afraid that somebody say, I would never play that like that. No, it's, it, it <laughs> turned out to be a very popular book and it got a lot of attention. Carlitos del Puerto is one that's in there. So there's some Latin. Is Oscar Cartaya in there? I can't even remember. I did it a while ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, just wanted to, to mention that to you. And uh, I, I think having your style in there en enhanced the book. And I think your uh, your your groovability was a, uh, a, a nice enhancement and a nice addition to the book. So thank you for your funk prowess oh thank you i'm honored i'm gonna definitely some, pick it up i'll pick it up. i had some uh, i had some double stops in there that uh, how would he do? but you know what was hard about it is because if i'm writing a funk book or a rock book or whatever i want to write what i want to say but I, I couldn't do that how would stanley do this how would david dyson do this? how would freddie washington do this you know so right. just, just wanted to share that with you and uh, thank you for your uh you know your base aura and your bass chops and uh, <laughs> i think you're a, a fine addition to those other people that bunny brunel alain caron chuck rainey uh, uh, yeah, all the cats are, go ahead. all the cats are listening to in college yep speaking of <laughs> chuck rainey when my son uh -huh. graduated from berkeley he he got to play at the graduation concert the night before and chuck okay. rainey was one of the honorees so wow. my son got That's to play. Cool. He's a guitar player. He played the solo in Kid Charlemagne, and they're doing all this Steely Dan stuff. But, oh, nice. but Chuck was one of the honorees, and uh, James Newton Howard, and uh, somebody you worked with, but I always forget if it's Layla or Lala Hathaway. Layla. Done. Layla, okay. She mm -hmm. was a, those three were honored, and you know, the next day, the actual graduation. So they each spoke for like 20 minutes or even longer. And then mm -hmm. President of Berkeley gets up and she says, uh, actually, there's a fourth person uh, that we are inducting with a, an honorary doctorate. Uh, it was not able to be here, but I'm pretty sure this person needs no introduction. Roll the video, please. And they roll the video and it's Ringo. Oh, wow. <laughs> He says, nice. Berkeley College of Music, peace and love. So, honored, <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> So you're you're bringing up a lot of a uh, lot of happy memories. One thing I want to mention before I forget: the Young Rascals had a big hit in the '60s called "Groovin." You probably know it by now. Groovin, wah wah wah, yeah. on a Sunday afternoon. Wasn't that the Young you Rascals? You know what? I did I not know, know that was them. <laughs> yeah, I did not know that was them at the time. I I had no idea. I was. Well, like, you should have called me, man. I would have told I, you. I know the song, but I didn't know that. I know. I know. <laughs> I, man, I felt so unprepared. And it's <laughs> funny. And speaking of unprepared, it's funny. There's a story. Uh, I have a story that I've told my son and my daughter and different things about at Berkeley. Um, so 
you know, there's, I don't know if it, if, if they do that now, but they had proficiencies, like you were rated, you had a certain rating as a player and mm. all, and you had a certain min- amount of proficiencies. You had to do like four proficiencies uh, before you graduate. And though that was to show that you were proficient at your instrument and the different levels. So I was so busy and playing with everybody else and doing all this stuff. And uh, I was getting notice, n- not- notices in my mailbox saying, you missed this proficiency. You missed me. And they, it was, they were putting red ink on it and saying, we remember this, like threatening me and everything. I don't know why I didn't do the proficiencies. It was, uh, oh, I, I know part Actually, why? Um, why it slipped past me? Because after I had Ed Freeland and after John Nevs and after John Rapucci, I didn't have another. I didn't have any more teachers. I didn't, you know, because you you can, you know, for the first year I had to teach. First two years I had the teachers, and then I guess the second or last year, uh, the third or last year, I, I didn't have any teachers. I opted out, and I should have signed up for Bruce Gertz. I probably couldn't have got him. He's probably backlogged. But all the killer players had, but you know, Bruce Gertz was, you know, and Bruce Gertz was always so cool. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so they they put these threats in my mail, you know, in my 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 mailbox. So my last year, I finally go to the proficiencies unprepared. I didn't know what to play, you know, and you need a teacher. I what my stupid self didn't know you need a teacher to to prepare you for all that stuff and tell you what you need to know to prepare for these proficiencies. So I get up in there and the whole base round table and they kind of like shot me down. They're like, my students coming in here talking about Dave Dyson this and Dave Dyson that, and you can't even come in here and be prepared and you this and that. And I I just felt so, you know, I just felt shot down and frustrated. And and then um, one of the basic players said, uh, one of the teachers said, let me know if you want to change your your principal instrument and all this stuff. I mean, it was a complete insult. I was like, how dare you? You know, so it's funny. The person that gave me the pep talk was none other than I went straight to, I was so mad. Um, Will Calhoun of uh, the drummer from, in, uh, from living color. Yeah. Excuse me. Can you and, move? I think it's your finger. or oh, your I'm, sorry. Or I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. So sure, the welcome. drummer, uh, yeah. The, so the, the drummer from uh, living color, he ended up giving me, of course, of course, he wasn't with them then, but uh, Will Calhoun was good, good, great friend of mine in um, Berkeley, and I joined his band called Dark Sarcasm. It was kind of like a a mix between what Living Color is now and like Fusion, so it was a mix between that. And um, I wonder if he, he keeps saying he's going to put that music out someday because we did a lot of recording. But anyway, I went to his room and he said, "Listen, Dyson, this is what you do." He said, "You go in there." And you you go into the chairman's office, which was Rich Appleman. You go in there, get everything that you need to 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 uh, be prepared to do all four proficiencies at once. Get every all the material, get all the jazz stuff, get all the classical stuff, get all everything that you need to prepare um, for the proficiencies, and go in there and bust it all all at once. And that's exactly what I did. And I remember that day. I went in. And there were like bass players hanging outside. You know, it was like bass central. Bass players hanging outside the door, waiting to go in and do their proficiency. And and they're all like, "So, uh, what proficiency is this for you? Oh, this is number two. Oh, this is my first one. Oh, this is my third one." And so somebody finally asked me, and I said, "I'm doing all of them." And they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> but I went in there with uh, I went in there with a mission, man. And um, so it was cool to have John Rapucci say he was proud of me and. You That's know, great. that I, that I, that I, you know, that I, you know, did finally, you know, had to back it down and, and do what I was supposed to do and then come in there and, and bust it out with flying colors. So, um, you know, I was proud of that. And I, I attribute that to my friend, Will Calhoun, <laughs> you know. All you needed was a little push. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, you know, you know, sometimes you, you, you know, sometimes you need that push. You need that inspiration, you know. Hey, before we wrap up, David, tell me a little bit about your bass gear. What kind of instrument and uh, strings, amps, effects, if any, that stuff. All right. Well, as far as uh, my bass, my bass is a Shoal made by Pete Shoal. Oh, yeah. And it's a 
in my um model I play is my signature model. Now there's supposed to be another updated limited edition signature uh, models coming out. I can't say when. Mm -hmm. Um, and but uh, there's supposed to be a, a limited um editions coming out soon. But uh, I love it. I love it. Matter of fact, I have number one and number eight right now. Wow, yeah, <laughs> Pete know, makes an incredible instrument. Who was a Damien Erskine player? Damien that? Erskine's too. Yeah, great, yeah. great instrument. Uh, great, and I have a. Um, you know, I have a bunch of. I have the fretless, my custom fretless made by him is killer, um, and the original one. Um, when when I went into uh, when I first met Pete, and he told me to, you know, I, I went to he picked me up from my gig and took me to his um, facility and let me play it. The first one I played, I was like, oh, I gotta have this one. You know, but the problem was the sound was great and all, but the body was too small for me. Like mm. I kept hitting the knobs. Um, because they were too close to the strings when I was solo. And um, you know, I played it off with the audience when it happened before, but I was like, oh no, I need a different I need a wider body down here. And and so now he calls that the Dyson cut, which is oh, pretty cool. Cool. Um but what it, kind so of strings like, do you play? I play um uh, Dunlop medium lights. Dunlop medium lights. Okay. And um my favorites, I like the nickel plated steel. Those are pretty cool for some reason. I, I, I like those a lot, but the nickel is fine. The steel is fine, but I prefer, uh, you know, my favorite is nickel, nickel plated, uh, nickel wrapped steel. Um, what as far about, as sound effects, yeah. Um, I don't use a lot of sound effects, especially live. Uh, maybe you know, maybe an octave if I need here and there, or, um, or um. What other, what other, uh, maybe a flange here and there, but basically I'm, I like to just go clean. It was a, it was a period of time where I was using all kind of effects, but yeah. uh, now I did try this new, what's it called? The bass, not mono synth by Electro Harmonics. It's cool, but it's the tracking still not good yet. It, it's going to be, it's going to be phenomenal once they get the tracking together. It's yeah. going to be, it's going to be a game changer, I think, but right now it's not. Uh, I hate to say it, uh, but it's just because the tracking's not good. But the sound, the sound, and everything is great. But the, the tracking's not good. I'll figure um, it out. Sure. What about yeah. house? Well, I've been with uh, um, a company out of Australia, Wayne Jones. Oh yeah, Wayne Jones. Yeah, Wayne Jones Audio, killer, killer amps and cabinets. Um, but also play. Um, uh, a buddy of mine out of this area, the DMV is up in like White Plains, Maryland, uh, glass tone cabinets. And it, those are my, uh, that's my workhorse. It's like a 210, 210 with a horn and then a 15 that kind of pumps out at the bottom. And it's so lightweight, incredibly lightweight. And it's a killer. And it's like 1200 watts. It is killer. So that's like my, that's like my workhorse when I'm at home. You know, it's easy. It's light. And um, different uh, as far as different heads, uh, they don't make it the Jens Ben Shuttle Nine, but I love it. It's like nine hundred watt head, head. That's a, that's a workhorse, as well as the um, what's the two thousand watt? I can't think of the name of it. The two thousand watt head of uh, uh, the name. The name escapes me now. I know you know the the the, the amp. Uh, it's uh. Uh, they they have the tube version and the solid state. I can't remember. Ampeg? <laughs> no. Galleon Kruger? No. No. Well, I'm trying to I think. Can't I think. I can't think of it. I can see it in my. I can see it in my. In my, in my I can't think of it. Um, but basically, but basically, the shuttle nine is what I use. Between the shuttle nine and then the Wayne Jones for big gigs, I'll go ahead and pull the Wayne Jones stuff out. You know? Yeah. Uh. What about the future? You've done a lot. You're doing a lot now. Is there anything that you haven't mentioned already or, or maybe something that you've always wanted to do that you haven't done yet? Someday I'm going to, or is there another album in the works or, uh, you know, what? Well, thank you for asking. Well, I've, um, I've been like over the pandemic, I've been writing for a lot of people. Like, um, that was a cool thing. I wrote something on Mesa's latest album, Najee's latest album. Mm -hmm. I wrote something for Jeanette Harris. I wrote uh, stuff for w Willie Bradley, you know. Um, so that's been really cool. But I haven't really been 
just because of the way the music industry is, I just haven't been inspired to do my own thing. Even but even though I've been writing, um, I, I, and a lot of people, are, even artists, have been hitting me up and, and trying to push me to do do another record. I just not inspired to, and only because of the industry. The industry is kind of weird right now, you know. Um, not like it used to be. Right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. But um, Take right that now, spell. that could mean something good or it could mean something not good. It's just a, that's that's <laughs> right. That's right. I'm going to leave that there, too. <laughs> I'm going to leave that there. But there is something that I do want to do um, that, that I'm, I have in the works now. And that's for like um, from elementary, uh, uh, even it could be from, you know, preschool or whatever to elementary all the way up to high school. Um, I want to start doing assemblies. And I might even, you know, bring in a couple of musicians too, but I've done some in the past for different schools, you know, in this area, but I want to start doing a big assemblies. Um, and the, the whole core of it will be focused on, um, like for anybody, whether you're, you have the passion for music and this will pull you in, you know, and, and inspire you, or whether you're just a music lover and you're not sure what you want to do yet, but it'll still grasp you and, and it'll, it will engage you as well as being that. So it's going to be educational, inspiring, and engaging at the same time. And, um, and I, I don't want to tell all the ideas I have, but I have some pretty cool ideas to pull everybody in and make it engaging. Now, what inspired this is just a couple of weeks ago, I did another school assembly. Uh, um, super private school in DC. Um, and the guy that was heading it, I was so embarrassed by the way it, it, it went because it could have been so much better. It wasn't engaging enough for the kids. You just can't get up on the mic and start rapping and think that they're going to think you're incredible. And he had all these kill, these killer musicians that have traveled the world, um, along with the DJ. And it was just, like looped music and and him sitting up there rapping and and thinking he's engaging the kids but it, I, I could see it on everybody's face and i was like this is so embarrassing if i did this it would be much better and I, and I started coming up with some ideas i said um and and what did that for me is that i remembered you know i wanted to give back because i remembered the the guy in my neighborhood who um i found out played bass and i saw him riding riding a bike down my, my in front of my mother's house. And I said, is your name at Larry Allen? He said, yeah. And I said, you play bass, right? He said, yeah. And I said, I always wanted to play bass, you know? And he said, he had me fun now. That's, that's kind of dangerous in these times. But he said, follow me home. I followed him home while he was on his bike. I walked to his house. And he let me go over there and just kind of bite, beat on his basses. And so anytime I just wanted to, I just walk over there and knock on the door. And he just let me go in this room and, and beat on his basis. And I appreciated that so much because because he that that was uh you know he that was nurturing you know you know for me and um uh, not everybody would do something like that and and it's funny that um just a year ago that very first bass that I played on at his house he gave it to me. Wow. And um there was some years ago I I, I gave him a custom bass too because I, I we reconnected because I we had been distant for a while. I hadn't, you know, seen him. And uh, cause he moved out of the area and um, I saw him and we were on the same show. He was in like, he's still in music. He's like in production. And so at the end of the production, uh, that last day I brought him the bass and the flight case, the custom bass with the LED lights up the neck and custom paint job. And I said, this is the least I could do for you for letting that little kid come in your house, you know, and banging him. And he was floored, you know, so that was all, all the, you know, that, that, that made it worthwhile. You know, that was just beautiful for me. Wow. I love hearing yeah, but, stories about people yeah. paying it forward. Very inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I have one more question for you, David. Yes, if, sir. If you could imagine, what would you be if you were not a bass player? Something outside of music. There's, t there's a couple of things I might be. One, I, w I might be, uh, you know, I had to decide this when I was younger because there's several passions that I had. I would either be a martial artist. I would probably be, in, you know, I would have been retired from the UFC by now. <laughs> or I would be a storm chaser. <laughs> well, 
weatherman. You'd see, and uh, cause that's one of the things I wanted to be a weatherman and tell it. But I used to sit out on my parents' car on the hood when I'd hear there was a storm coming or a tornado, and I would study the clouds. That's all I bought. I would go to the library and get books on weather, and I would study all that hurricanes, tornadoes, storms, severe, you know, the clouds. So that's still that was that was always a passion of mine. Well, so you know, I would either be a weatherman or a martial artist. <laughs> I've interviewed over 850 bass players, and I asked that question at the end. And would you believe it? You're actually the second person to give me that answer about being a weatherman. What? The first That's was cool. Tommy Stinson from Guns N' Roses. Wow. And he just he just blurted it out without saying, oh, I, I always wanted to be a TV weatherman. Always wanted to be a TV weatherman. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is great. Thank you so much for, for sharing all these one story after another after another. All awesome, inspiring stories and uh, great things to think about and very practical advice for anybody who wants to learn bass. Thank you for sharing all that with us, David. No, oh, no, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And because and I, you know, I can go on and on, you know, <laughs> but thank you for the opportunity. Oh, another thing is it's never too late. It's never too late to pick up the bass. Never. So or, no, or any other instrument, you know, just, you know, uh, you know, so that that's another thing, you know, because people, you know, people you hear that all the time. I'm sure you do, too. Yeah, I used to play bass. or I used to say it's not too late to get it, pick it back up, you know, or I used to want to play piano. It's never too late, even if it's just for yourself, you know, I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. If you've ever wanted to play bass, you should know that right now there are thousands of people inside the For Bass Players Only community. A lot of them over 50, they are learning bass, playing music that they love, and just having the time of their life. You should come join them and experience that incredible transformation for yourself. Because as I always say, and as David Dyson says, you're never too old to groove. So let's play bass. Thank you again, David Dyson, for joining us. Great having you. And we'll have to have you back because I know there's a lot more that we can get into that we didn't this time. But <laughs> right. I, I will see all of you right here next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, Let's play bass.